Hey, hello there. My name is Rob Reinhold. This is Darren Fisher. And we've had a lot of our traders and the public reach out to us to ask us, what is Maverick Trading's take on the Netflix show, Eat the Rich? So Darren, what is your take overall on the show, Eat the Rich? I thought it was an awesome docuseries. Okay, it's a story that needed to be told and it needed to be broadcast to a, to a wide audience. But in doing that, they missed a lot of key points that a professional trader you know would, would key in on and would and I think would find really interesting. Oh sure. I think they made that movie for the general public. They couldn't get into real complicated things. No, no they couldn't. I mean what I think they missed a little bit is that overall this is a story of greed, hubris, and really poor risk management. Not only on the hedge fund side, but also on the retail trader side. Mm -hmm. I mean that that's the key. I mean there were there there was a line in that movie where someone was looking at it and she said it, it just looked like a bunch of degenerate gamblers and when you look at their activity at their at their process at just the i am right the the justification for for doing this you can see that there was no risk management there no. and it was i mean that was really sad I mean, you, you've got some people made a lot of money the hedge funds lost a bunch of money but then there were some retail traders that got burned on this as well. And it was just, it was just really bad risk management. Yeah. I loved, I loved early 2021 yeah. because I've been trading since 1997 mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen craziness like that since the, the dot coms. Yeah. S since the early part of March, 2000, things were just as crazy then. And I thought, Oh, I'll never see this again. Mm -hmm. And we saw it again. And actually I think it was crazier. I think the price action was crazier in 2021 than it was in 2000. It was. And I mean, we were talking about this before. This was not just a shotgun style, throw spaghetti on the wall type of type of trade. These guys on Wall Street bets were very focused and you know they found a potential candidate for a short squeeze. And the way they did it was was just just masterful. Absolutely. Yeah, people think this happened out of nowhere. No. This was a very, very deliberate attack of a specific stock mm -hmm. because they identified this stock. I think we can get this thing to run up. Yeah. I mean, they, they were going back to So all this came down at the end of January, but they were talking about this from August. So I mean, th this is a five-month operation to begin with. And this is what a lot of people don't know is there, were, uh, there was 140% short interest in... GameStop as a stock. And they, let's, let's go over that. Yeah, let's go quick, over really. I know that we're going to have some people that don't understand that. Um, there's what's called the float of the stock. Yeah. This is how many shares are available to the public. Mm -hmm. And you can take a look and see, okay, what percentage of the float is sold short? And most stocks are going to be somewhere in the 3 to 5% range. Maybe 10% is high, 20% a little higher. Mm -hmm. 140% should theoretically be impossible. It should. Theoretically, it should. that should not be able to happen because in order to sell a stock short, you have to borrow it from someone else. Yeah. So how can you sell 140% of the amount of shares short? It's called naked shorting. You know what that is. I know what that is. But you know, naked shorting is when you, are, when you sell the shares short, but you don't have them. Now, market makers are allowed to do this. Uh, and to, institutions. And institutions. You're, you're allowed to do this, but market makers specifically are allowed to do this with, with no rate, uh, with no impediments. It's to you know, facilitate the smooth running of the markets. Now, the institutions, you know, the, the hedge funds, you can naked short, but you have to put out what's called a locate. And that locate is you have to go and find the shares to borrow so you can sell them short. Now I'm I'm now not for retail for retail. for retail they are not allowed to sell it short until they find the until stock until they get that locate so, so yeah so they have to actually have the stock mm -hmm. and the institutions they can sell it first and say oh we'll find the stock later yeah we'll we'll just find it later and give it to you then yeah so again how do we get to 140 percent of the float uh, you know short it's you've got I think it's 13 days to locate the shares. 
But then if you can't locate the shares, you can refile the locate. And refile it again, and refile it again, again, and refile it again. And that's exactly what happened, is that uh, certain hedge funds, they thought GameStop was going out of business. Yeah. And they said, hey, let's pile on as much short positions as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And they were selling short, filing their locates, and then just refiling them in order to basically not have to comply with the law. So I love the Wall Street Bets guys. They saw this and they said, okay, if we can get enough people together Mm -hmm. to, to buy these shares, we can force these hedge funds to go back and buy those shares back, which will force it even higher. Yeah. So that's what happened. They got together and they got enough people on board Mm -hmm. and they started to attack that stock and instructing people, hey, go out and buy these shares. And not just that, but go out and buy some options. Go through like the options, what actually really made this drive higher. Yeah, absolutely. So I just got some numbers right here and and these are wholly theoretical here, just so everybody knows. Let's say you have $10,000 that you wanna put into this trade. 8,000 of that, you buy the stock. Okay, 20% of it, $2,000, you buy an out of the money option. Okay, let's just say something that's so out of the money, it's got a 0.01 delta. Well, I actually read okay. um, messages that Wall Street Bets was making saying, hey, buy, if you've got $50,000 to invest in this, buy $40,000 of stock and buy $10,000 of the one year away $1,000 calls. Like that is so far away. It is one thousand dollars for when the stock is trading at fifty or sixty. Mm-hmm. But what does that do? That gives the market makers, that gives the options market makers, a negative delta exposure. Since they've sold you that call, they are short that point zero one delta. So how are they going to square that up? They're going to buy the shares. Mm-hmm. All right. So to, and that's to, how the options market makers work. If they take a negative delta position here, they take a positive delta position here. Yeah, exactly. And so the more negative delta that the market makers are getting exposed to, mm-hmm. the more shares they have to buy. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, so if you did you know, 2,000 options at 10 cents a piece, okay, that's uh, with $2,000, okay, that's 20,000 options contracts. All right, so you've just, and if the delta is 0.01, You've just forced that market maker to buy 20,000 shares to further the trade. Okay. And for every 0.01 that delta goes up, that market maker is buying uh, another 20,000 shares. Now, let's say you get, let's say the stock's trading at, you know, at 40 and you buy, you know, the front or following month $100 calls. All right. Those at the time, probably 0.01 Delta, very, very cheap. You know, in normal times, this would be a horrible bet. Okay, but as the short squeeze happens, once if that gets at the money, yep. which it did, at that point, once it's at the money, your Delta's about 50. Yeah. So that market maker is buying a million, has bought a million shares on, you know, yeah, on behalf amazing. of the trade. And when you get deep in the money, I mean, as the short squeeze goes on, once it's deep in the money, your delta is essentially 100. That market maker's bought 2 million shares for you on an initial investment of $2,000. And so it was just, I thought it was very cleverly done. It was. And they they made it to where the hedge funds that were short felt a lot of pain. Oh, they did. And the people doing this were targeting the hedge funds. They They were were angry at the hedge funds and the professionals and the people that have manipulated markets for years. Yeah. They're like, we're going to get them back. And it put Melvin Capital out of business. Yeah. Put some other hedge funds out of business. Yeah. I mean, total total losses for the hedge funds, I think, were were $20 billion. Mm -hmm. Melvin Capital was over eight of that. Yeah. I mean, that is just, that's horrific risk management. And here's the thing. Here's where the greed came in. They were so sure of themselves that GameStop was gonna to go to zero, that they never covered their shorts. Yeah. I mean, they, they were shorting this thing from the time it was 40 to 30 to 20, they could have covered it $4.50, yeah. booked a profit and just, and just moved on. They didn't. Well, you know, you got that on the other side too. You do. Where, where so you had these hedge funds that were stubborn, would not get out of the trade. Mm-hmm. And then once there was enough people on the long side, mostly retail, 
we got the same thing. We did. We got the same thing. It's like, hey, we're never selling. We're never going to get out of this trade. We, we got diamond hands. Remember the diamond oh, hands? Oh, the, the diamond hands. I, 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 I saw that and my stomach dropped a little bit. Because as soon as someone said that, I was like, somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of people did. Yeah. Now, sadly, here's the irony of it. You know, we, the, the people doing this needed everyone to hold it and stay in it. Yeah. So they, they said, hey, don't sell. And the people that listened, they didn't sell. But the people that didn't have diamond hands, ironically, they're the ones who actually made money out of this whole thing. They, yeah, they, they sold. Did. They followed their system. They bought the shares. They sold it. They took their profits and moved on to the next one. Well, and that's the thing. There was no plan. I mean, if you're, you're Canada short squeeze, great. I mean, that, that's a plan. But as soon as, uh, as soon as the brokerages restricted buying GameStop, the trade was over. Yeah. And if you didn't know what you're doing, you probably held on. If you knew what you're doing and knew that the trade was over right then, uh, you know, I think it hit over just slightly over five hundred dollars at its peak. Okay, you could if you're seeing this thing go up, you can put a limit order in, as, as weird as it sounds, you can put a limit order in and say, I'm gonna sell at five hundred dollars, I wanna sell at four hundred dollars. And you know, if you've bought you know, low down, you know, four, ten, twenty, thirty, that's an awesome profit. Yeah. That's a, that's an awesome profit, especially if you were buying some of those those what were out of the money calls at that point in time. Those are now in the money, yeah. and you you can sell those right there. But it's this idea that you're never this was a trade. Yeah, this was not an investment for the long term. This was a trade. If you didn't have a plan when to get out, if you didn't have a plan when to manage your risk, I mean, there were people that got in late, and didn't know what to do when that buy button disappeared. Yeah. Didn't understand what was going to happen. They could have sold too. Yeah. They, they could have sold. The uh, hedge funds could have bought. And they had to in the end. Well, what did you think about... Because I, I remember watching this whole thing just live on the screen. Mm -hmm. And when, when the alert went out that they were no longer allowing the public to buy these shares. I thought to myself, this is unprecedented. It, yeah. This has never happened before, mm -hmm. and uh, it caused a lot of anger it did. in the community because once they said we're restricting any more buys on this, the engine that was driving this whole thing higher stopped. Yeah, and so the only thing it can do is is go back down. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened to people. Yeah, it did. They just, I mean, they still had the option to sell, but it was everybody rushing for the exits. I mean, there, there was no more, there was no more demand, no more real demand, no more artificial demand. So when you have that, even the smallest amount of supply is going to drop the price. But that's exactly the opposite of what happened on the way up. If there's no supply, the smallest amount of demand is going to spike the price up. Yeah. And that's what that's what people didn't get. That's what a lot of these uh, what analysts didn't get is they said you know, it's decoupled from the truth. Well, look, buddy, there's no truth in trading. The truth is the price on that screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't matter what you think the truth is. It matters what's the supply, what's the demand, where's the price going to go? And even the analysts forgot that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people just didn't even understand how the brokerage community works. Uh, the brokerage community can halt a stock at any time. Yeah. They can, uh, again, remove the ability to buy. And people say, well, how can they do that? And if you understand like what really happened with Robinhood, mm -hmm. they were forced to do that by yeah. their clearing firm. Yeah. They said, uh, pony up three billion dollars overnight. Uh, and or... they don't. They don't have three billion dollars. No. And so what happened was that they had to do it. Mm -hmm. The clearing firm really screwed over Robinhood, and by default, Robinhood screwed over all of its clients. Mm -hmm. But it was all to keep the system from collapsing because it really could have caused some big firms to just collapse and go yeah. out of business. And it, I mean, Robinhood was highlighted because that's what a lot of the these Wall Street bets guys were using. But it was, you know... It was systemic. It was systemic. I mean, you know, when, when we're getting notices, you know, and, and we use a, a professional-grade brokerage, uh, institutional-grade brokerage, when we're getting notices that no, you know, we're not allowing any new positions in GameStop, any new long positions in GameStop, we're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. For, you know, they're forbidding institutions from doing this. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just, I mean, they had to. They had to save the system is yeah. what it was. I agree. As, as terrible as it was, uh, 
you kind of sometimes do have to save the system. Yeah. I hate, I hate to say that because I'm against <laughs> the system a lot of the times. I hate the system, but my livelihood is the system. Exactly. So I kind of wanted to stick around. Yeah, we, we don't want to break that toy. Yeah. So what do you think is the one big takeaway? Anyone who is a retail trader, into trading a little bit, looking to get into trading. What's your one takeaway? And then I'll give my one takeaway. I've got a couple. Okay. One, you have to be a mercenary, not a martyr. You are, you are not marrying a stock. Okay. This is not till death do us part. This is, I am riding this bus uptown or downtown for a set period of time. I don't care which way it goes. I just want to make a little money on it. Okay. So that would be, that would be my first takeaway. Be a mercenary, not a martyr. My second takeaway is it doesn't matter if you're a beginning trader. It doesn't matter if you've got $20 billion under management as a hedge fund. You always have to trade with risk management. And if you forget that, at that point, you are a degenerate gambler. And it doesn't matter if you wear a suit or if you wear sweatpants. You've got to trade with risk management. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, risk management is the real story here. It is. Just like protect your capital. And my takeaway is that the market can do anything. Yes. And and I've always said, you know, the market is a big wild animal. Mm -hmm. It's completely unpredictable, uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. And I always do it to like a lion tamer. Where you've got this lion in a cage. And the lion tamer, you can stay outside the cage Mm -hmm. as much as you want. You don't have to get in the lion cage every single minute every day. Yeah. So as a trader, we have to look at the market and say, okay, I don't need to be in there all the time. No. And your job as a trader is to pick the times you go into the lion's den. And you pick times like after they've been fed. You <laughs> pick times. And so you have ultimate control. We have no control over what the market does. Mm-hmm. And the market is going to surprise us for the rest of our lifetimes of how crazy it can be. Mm-hmm. But what we can control is our behavior and our actions. Yes. And if you're just out there not thinking, you're going to get controlled by the market. But if you are thinking and you're diligent, and you're planning, you're following system, following rules, GameStop was a trade for you. Exactly. It was, you made a little bit, you lost a little bit, you made a good amount, it, whatever it was, you sold that one and you just moved on to the next one. Yeah. For anyone who didn't have that, GameStop is either going to be, oh my gosh, I made $8 million off of 20000 Yeah. which you go try to do that again, you'll lose all your money. That exactly. was a once in a lifetime deal. Or you remember how one the one time you decided to invest in stocks, you got rolled, mm-hmm. and now you got a bad taste in your mouth, and now you're never going to invest in stocks again. Yeah, those are the two outcomes when you have no plan, when you mess with a stock like this. Exactly. No, so you have control. Exactly. Well, I think that kind of wraps up our thoughts. I think it does. GameStop. So we appreciate you joining us here, and uh, just remember, manage your risk. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you.